34 slides, but I think there's going to be a message in those, okay? This isn't going to be a slideshow like you usually get when you go to Israel and come back. So uh, we talked about learning things from the Lord today. We sang about that. I'm trusting that you're going to learn something today and that God's going to surprise you um, near the end of our time together. You've already seen the last slide for quite a while up there. <clears throat> we'll talk about that if I have time to get to it. <clears throat> I have one scripture in um, Luke 8, verse 17. Let me read this to you. Jesus is talking. He says, There is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. The background to my title picture Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to replace you with a 10-year-old. Oh, careful. <laughs> That's right. You may have to give us a verbal. Yeah, a verbal slideshow. All right. Yeah. I can do that. I can pretty much do that. There's this, beautiful, there's this beautiful picture of an olive grove, okay, up on the screen. Pretend you see that, okay? The olive tree is one of the symbols for Israel. <clears throat> how appropriate when you think of how an olive and its oil is used. Think about this for a minute. You eat them. They use the oil for anointing, for healing, for light and lamps, for bringing light. And also for uh, anointing for, for leadership. So I can keep going? Okay. I actually uh, gave serious thought and uh, enough so to, to let Teresa know that the title of what I'm sharing today is The Unearthing, The Uncovering, The Unearthing. And you'll see why uh, I've come up with that as we go along. You ready? Hold on to your seats here, okay? I need to publicly say thank you to the Lord for the opportunity I had to visit the Promised Land with the Bix group of the class of 2022. You may not have known, but the Klein family from this church were the folks who secured this trip for me. They gave this to me several years ago. Both Ron and Marilyn were alive in 2019 when we began planning this event. Unfortunately, both have died in the interim, and neither one of them is going to have a chance to hear my report until we see one another again in the new Jerusalem. But I have to make a special thanks to their daughters, Cindy and Brenda, for their efforts to make the arrangements for this trip. The trip was actually canceled, technically, six times during the COVID-19 epidemic. The last time was the day we were going to go. It had been pushed back again. COVID raised up its ugly head all through the process. We're convinced that many of us on the team had COVID while we were touring there. It followed us to the very last day. And then add another week. And if I have time, I'll talk to you about that. Number two. Next slide. This is a photo of the photo of our group right here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we all, most of us purchased that. 30 of us traveled over to Tel Aviv on March 16th of this year. Two years after the initial target date. Team leaders are in the front row, and people that you might know are Steve Ross, fourth in with the hat, Mike Tuttle, who grew up in this church, his mom used to sit right over there in the corner with Tony, is second one in with the white pants. What a wonderful leader he is. Okay. Um, our excellent tour guide, you've already been introduced to him on the left, is Andre, our bus driver at the far right. Uh, is the best in the country, say some. His name is Johnny. 
Third in is Andy Rice. He's the president of Bix right now. Bix stands for Berkshire Institute of Christian Studies. And then there's Ben Bohm. You see Ben? And Ben's wife is in the back, hiding by a guy with a, um, with a um, cowboy hat on. Do you see Jackie there? Those two wonderful servants, um, they're a big part of what happens down at Bix also. They were a huge help to all of us. And then Jackie's mom and dad are all, have also joined us on the trip. Notice our apparel. It was cold most of the time that we were in the country. Springtime is a great time to visit, visit Israel. The flowers are beginning to come out. The trees are budding. But the rest of the year, it's pretty dusty and brown there. <clears throat> but the trade-off is it's cold sometimes. And it was cold all of the time that we were there. Next slide. We had eight, count them, eight Advent Christian pastors traveling together on this trip. All of them friends of mine. So we had plenty of talent for devotions and worship times that happened throughout every day that we were there. I roomed with David Ross. He's the one with the USA shirt on. Um, he's pastoring right now in North Carolina. He was previously the executive director of our denomination, held, held that position for many years. Next slide. This was a Berkshire Institute for Christian Studies trip. Touring the Holy Lands has always been a part of the Bix experience. This year, they had six students. Five of them were able to go on the trip. Um, the four girls in the front, second one in is Jackie's mom. She doesn't count. Okay. In the back, on the left, is Dan Keniston. And the third one in is Isaiah, um, from Dave, uh, one of David's relatives, I think a, a nephew of his. Again, uh, then there's Mike, and then Jackie's dad, uh, and, and then Ben and Jackie, okay, on the end. Graduation was yesterday in Lenox, Massachusetts. I was able to be there for that wonderful event and saw a bunch of these people. It was like a reunion. The students were wonderful. They were assigned reports at certain sites. We toured 65 sites. The tour guides say that's unprecedented. Old and New Testament places. The students would often do a skit, a drama to illustrate what happened at a site. This was in Gedi, where Gideon was asked by God to reduce his army from 10,000 down a bit. A bit. God thought he had too many. So the story in Judges 6, 5 um, says he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, you shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to the, their mouths, was 300 men. With a small number, Gideon and his troops won, or they defeated their enemy of thousands. This is the place where that happened. The girls are doing the lapping. The guys are using their hands, all right, in the skit. Next slide. This is Tell, tell Megiddo. Say tell. tell. Okay. A tell is a hill where a city has been built. Sometimes dozens of times the same city has been built there over and over because of an earthquake or because of a tragedy or, or uh, uh, some, the enemy came in and took over. And so the city just keeps getting taller and taller. They just keep building on top of itself. There are more than 200 tells in Israel. Don't say it. No telling, right? <laughs> okay. All of them destroyed by disaster or war. That's why the hill can keep getting higher. There's Tel Arad. There's Tel Dan, there's Tel Jericho, there's Tel Beersheba, all of these, Tel Aviv, all of these are examples. I included this picture because it shows a fruitful valley. We're up on a Tel, Tel Megiddo. Everywhere we went in Israel, excluding the wilderness sites, you would find acres and acres, miles and miles of fruit trees. The fig tree, orange groves, date palms, olive trees, vineyards, bananas. I couldn't believe all the banana fields uh, in Israel. 
you'd look over on a hillside and it looked like it snowed there. I said, what's that? And they, and they said, that those are bananas. They have 12-foot um, tents made out of cheesecloth that would go for acres and acres. Every 200 feet there was a space where you could bring a tractor into the field. But it was covered, unusual, crazy. <clears throat> I was struck by the fruitfulness of the land, but I guess I shouldn't have been because this is the same land the spies reported on in Numbers 13, verse 27. We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. And they brought back with them, <clears throat> and to all the congregation they showed them the fruit of the land. It's noteworthy, it's extraordinary, all the fruitfulness of the country of Israel. This next picture shows some of those flourishing fields from up on Mount Arbel. Now I'm up by the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is up in the corner, okay? <clears throat> right in front of Bruce. Have you ever heard of the Jesus Triangle? Some people call it the Evangelical Triangle. This is really cool. Right before, below the hill, if you look over the hill, don't go too close because you'll fall over. But if you, you go over the hill straight in front of Bruce, that's where Capernaum is, all right? And a whole lot of... A whole lot of the New Testament happened there. If Bruce, if Bruce put his hand out to the left here, just to the left of that um, road, all right, and then put his hand this way, all right, from Capernaum <clears throat> over to Bethsaida, because I'm nervous here, I'm, I'm, I'm missing this next one. Chorazin, Chorazin's over here to the left. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Most of the miracles that happened in the New Testament that Jesus did are in that triangle right there. Isn't that interesting? Up near the, up near the Sea of Galilee. Um, these three towns, by the way, were mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 11.20. You can look there if you want. They were also cursed by Jesus in Luke chapter 10, verse 13. Verse 13. None of those... None of those areas have people living there, only ruins, okay, in those three places. <clears throat> um, this next picture shows some of the flourishing fields from up on, oh, I already did that. It was amazing, <laughs> okay, it was amazing to me how different things look in real time compared to what I grew up thinking things would look like there. <clears throat> For instance, Nazareth, this is Nazareth. This is where Jesus grew up. I've always had a picture in mind of the town that Jesus grew up in. This isn't it. <laughs> Nazareth is the largest Arab city in the country. Andres, uh, our tour guide's family is from there. This is known as the Arab capital of Israel. This is Nazareth. My roommate, David, <coughs> Next slide. He's in the red hoodie. Remember him? He shared with me that things look much different now than when he first visited the country 44 years ago in 1978. One of the reasons for this is the archaeological digs that are going on continually in that, in that area of the world. Folks were digging out parts of Jericho when we visited Tel Jericho. There were college students there with buckets and small brooms and shovels. Why is this important? Because expert te experts tell us that less than 5% of what has been discovered in Israel has been dug up, has been uncovered, has been unearthed. There are so many more treasures for us to unearth so many more things that will confirm the biblical narrative <clears throat> that are ahead for us. The ancient gate <clears throat> was unearthed in 1979, right here. Before that it was covered over. No one knew it was there until 1979. This is in Tel Dan. It has been estimated to have been built back in 1750 BCE at the foot of Mount Hermon. It's named after the biblical patriarch, some since some people speculate it may have been used by Abraham during the rescue of his nephew Lot. I get to stand here in the same place where Abraham perhaps has walked. 
The gate, which is composed of three arches and constructed of sun-dried mud brick on a foundation of large basalt stones, has been restored to its original height of seven meters. The state-run authority said it is the largest gate of its kind in the world. The arches of the gate are believed to be the oldest ever found in Israel. But they're still digging. <clears throat> Here's another example of what I'm talking about. This is a great example. This is Caesarea Mer Maritima. It was one of our first stops. It's where, it's one of, it's where King um, Herod the Great had his palace, one of his favorite palaces. He had palaces all over Israel. <clears throat> it included, in this area, it included uh, a theater where 4,000 people could sit, okay, that had been unearthed, okay, but under the ground. There was an aqueduct there. One of the largest structures we saw here was this hippodrome, huge thing. Um, it could seat 20,000 people. It was the site of chariot races and gladiator spectacle, um, spectacles. <laughs> I need some different spectacles. <laughs> As we walked through it on our first day in Israel, David told me that he did not see this when he was visiting 44 years ago. He said it wasn't here. He says, where was it? He said it was a parking lot where they parked the buses. And we went and looked at the other things that had been dug up. This was all under the ground. It had all been unearthed over these last couple, several decades. What's gonna, what are we going to find two decades from now? I thought that was incredible. More blood could have been shed here in this place than in the Roman Colosseum. And as we walked through it, <clears throat> did I already read that? All right. Um, here, here it was, exposed now to the light. Previous, all of it had been hidden under the ground. So much of what you want to see in the Holy Lands is underground. Next slide. You have to go down flights of stairs, 20, 40 feet down under the ground, because things have been covered, usually under an old church. Christians have built over these sacred places so that the world won't forget what happened there. Here in this picture, you see a Catholic sister giving a tour of what we think was the Virgin Mary's house. Did you see this, Russ, when you were there? Okay. Underneath that church, they have found where the Virgin Mary's family lived. It's a house in Nazareth. There's even a room there where they think Joseph had his workshop. There's stones there. There are walls there under this place. Fascinating to me. Not all tours take the time to see places like this, but Bix does. Some believe that Joseph's tomb is also here in this place, down, down where the town used to be. The famous Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. We visited this busy place. I prayed up next to the wall. We were visiting during the Shabbat celebration. The area was crowded with families celebrating weddings and bat mitzvahs. There was drums and horns and singing. What's interesting to me is only two-thirds of the wall can be seen from up there where we were at. The other third of the 100-foot wall is underground. People have been digging down there for years. Museums are down under the ground. Okay. There's a synagogue, a beautiful modern synagogue that's been built down near where this wall is. To spotlight what is down there. There are portions of the wall that are 2,040 years old down there. The original foundation stones that the Herod the Great had made to construct a second temple can be seen down there. I saw one of them. I touched one of them. There's a stone in the wall so large, so heavy, that no modern crane has yet been invented by man that can move it. I took a picture of it and brought it home to you. It's down there under the ground. It's been unearthed. <clears throat> there are, of course, the sites that we all want to see in the Holy Lands. Places where Jesus walked. In this case, where he floated 
where he floated, not just walked. The Sea of Galilee. It's where he commanded the waves and the winds to cease in Mark 4, 39-41. I had the privilege, the awesome privilege, of doing devotions while out on the Sea of Galilee in one of these big boats called the Jesus Boat. Some of you know what I'm talking about. In Nazareth, again, in Nazareth, in the lower parts of the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. I get ahead of myself. Yeah, we're good. This is what you were talking about, Russ. Down in the lower parts of the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is an elaborate 11 or silver 14 pointed star that marks the spot was where Jesus was said to be born. Why are there 14 points there? Hmm. There's 14 generations from Abraham to David and from David to Christ. That's why there's 14 points there. It doesn't look anything like the manger that I remember being taught about as a kid. <laughs> Nothing like it. And there's this whole elaborate church all around you um, that you walk through to get to it and then walk down to it. One of the highlights for me, 16, was coming into the city and seeing the Dome of the Rock in the ancient city of Jerusalem. We spent three solid days touring things there. The Dome of the Rock is where the temple had been. I'll talk about that. The Temple Mount is where King Solomon built the first temple in 1000 BC. It was later torn down by Babylon's King Nebuchadnezzar. Herod the Great built the second temple today. <coughs> built the second temple. Today a Muslim mosque stands where the first and second temples stood. Though beautiful, it is actually one of the most pagan parts of the Holy Land. Many Jews believe that this impediment must be removed so the new temple can be built there. A giant menorah has already been made for it. We had lunch at a park where it's displayed. <clears throat> this, of course, is in the Jewish quarter. <clears throat> the mount is well guarded <clears throat> in the Muslim quarter. You need to pass through a checkpoint before walking up to the mount. Looking for guns? Yes. But just as concerning looking for Bibles, Bibles are not allowed up here on the mount. <clears throat> I'm up, to, I'm up to 17 now. You ready? Why don't you stand up for a minute? I don't want you to get tired. Stand up and then sit back down. And I'll take a drink. I don't want you to say, Oh, that was a boring slideshow that Pastor brought. I used to be bored by missionaries bringing their slideshows home. And I don't want to do that. <coughs> okay. Remember the story of David and Goliath? This is where it happened, in the valley of Elah. 1 Samuel 17, 40. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. This is a seasonal brook where we're at. And put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch. <clears throat> and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. We're standing here. I've stood there in that same place where David got the stones. I even reached down and brought one home. I don't think it's as big as the one that he probably used because there have been a whole bunch of Bix trips that have gone ahead of me and they've all picked them up. <coughs> this was a highlight for me, this next one. We're down in, the, in a cave in the bowels of this beautiful church in Nablus. In the Bible it's called Shechem, where we were at. We were ushered down to this old well. I'm talking about an old well. Jacob dug this well 3,800 years ago. Well, wells don't move. <clears throat> this is the most certain of all biblical sites right here. A Samaritan woman came here to draw water. Do you remember that story? Jesus asked her for a drink in John 4, 7. And at, at this very spot in the conversation, she said, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And Jesus answered and said, 
to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. <coughs> she was right, the well is deep. Uh, and Andre poured some water down. He says, and you listen. He poured some more water down. He says, and you listen. 180 feet down. And he started cranking it up. I said, Andre, I says, can I do that? He says, sure. So I, I let the bucket down, and then I cranked it up 180 feet and took it out. And people, a lot of us took a drink out of the Jacob's well. That was pretty cool. Pretty cool event. This Greek Orthodox church that is over the top of, over the top of it is in Palestine. <coughs> it's magnificent. Years ago, a monk from Greece he and his brother both went into ministry years ago, but this guy was assigned to the church, and he was an artist. Much of the mosaic work and the wall, wall murals were painted by him. It's breathtaking. The work he did up on the dome, I took a picture above, above my head. <clears throat> you, see, you see my head? Yeah. Took him, took him six, six months, six months to do that work. Twelve apostles around around the edge that he did up there. This guy pretty much gave his life to this project, to this church. Father Ustinos became the guardian of the well. That's what they call him. Palestinian attacks are not uncommon in this part of the world. A hand grenade was hurled into the church in 1982, and a nun leading a tour there was wounded. <coughs> huh? Yeah, I poured that in this cup too. It doesn't taste like Jacob's well. I think it's from a different one. <coughs> Thank you, Mel. The Guardian working with Archimandrati Eustinos, that's his name, was murdered in the church a few years back. The priest was buried beside the edifice. Father Eustinos has built the crypt on the other side of the church for himself when he dies. And here he is, 81 years old. He knows our guide, Andre, from other tours, and I had to get a picture. He's given his life to this place. He's going to die there and be buried outside of the church there. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned theirs, Stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Matthew 23, 37. Here I am taking a picture out through the beautiful window as Jackie is taking a picture of me standing perhaps where Jesus stood with tears in his eyes. We're in the Dominus Flevet Church. It's on the downside of the Mount of Olives in the area where Jesus in Luke 19, 41 approached Jerusalem. He saw the city and wept over it, anticipating its impending destruction. The church is built in the shape of a teardrop called the Teardrop Church. <clears throat> it has this most gorgeous view that lines up where the temple had been. The Dome of the Rock is where the temple had been. By the way, the temple was twice as high is the Dome of the Rock when Herod, Herod the Great um, built it. Could be seen almost from everywhere. <clears throat> and uh, behind, behind the temple is uh, lines right up with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. <clears throat> we went to the Garden of Gethsemane. What was impressive to me weren't just the olive trees, which are pretty impressive, um, the originals are probably not there because when Rome came in to destroy the city, they cut all the trees down just to insult the Jewish people. <clears throat> but what was impressive to me is there's a rocky ledge in this area. I didn't, take a, I, I didn't bring the picture to you. Where Jesus probably prayed in Mark 14, 36, Abba, Father, <clears throat> all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. I'm so glad he didn't give in. I'm so glad he kept on going, or we wouldn't be here today celebrating what we celebrate 
that Jesus has given to us. We went up to the top of Masada. We have to use a tram to get up there, a fancy thing on a cable. <clears throat> this is a Judean fortress overlooking the Dead Sea, not far from one of our hotels. We stayed in three different hotels. <clears throat> the Jews were revolting against the unreasonable taxes of the Romans. They were held up in this fortress. The Roman legions came down in 73 to 74 AD <clears throat> to lay siege to the holdouts. There were 967 people up in this fortress. And then the Roman legions built this ramp. You can see the ramp. <clears throat> when the fi Romans finally broke through into the mountaintop fortress, <clears throat> they found no one alive. All had committed suicides. Fathers had taken out their families. They had all, they had all did lots with one another to determine who was going to kill who. Horrible wonderful strange story they had plenty of food and storage and water they wanted to make sure the Romans knew that <clears throat> they were not going to give the pagan Romans any satisfaction any satisfaction in conquering them see the two stages down to the right way down to the right there's way over there see those two little spots those are giant stages with um, bleachers in front of them <clears throat> shows you how big that ramp is. Um, this is where for years all Israeli soldiers would come to pledge their allegiance and make their oath um, to the country. Uh, in recent years they stopped doing that, which is kind of sad. The Qumran caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found just around the corner from Masada, we saw the jar that, they, they, that had been unearthed unearthed in um, 1964 or 1946 which held the Isaiah scroll in cave number one <clears throat> in our last touring hour in Israel we visited the Israeli Museum where we saw the collection of scrolls and the Isaiah scroll that had been in that jar that was pretty cool again another church in Nazareth built on top of what was a synagogue. This was Jesus' home synagogue. Remember when he attended one Sabbath day <clears throat> as he was beginning his ministry in Luke 4, 17, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him? He read the scriptures there out of Isaiah concerning himself. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. He went on to say, Today this scripture has been filled in your hearing. His ministry was launched in this place, probably down on the ground in, in an earlier one. This is one that had been built a little bit later. <clears throat> everything's, down, everything's underground. Next time I go back, I'll show you a picture of the original one, okay? Three years later, he was arrested, taken to the high priest's house. Caiaphas was serving in the temple at that time. Under Caiaphas' home here were dungeons. We went there. We went down to where they were at, a staging area and a holding area for prisoners. <clears throat> for Jesus, it might have been a torture chamber. Because the officials had to wait for a full court decision, the next day, Jesus would require a place to exist till morning. There was a place for him to be contained down underneath this house. Next picture. We're standing here in what is called the deep pit. Have you ever heard of this? The deep pit? I'm looking up probably eight feet up at a ceiling and I took this picture, this hole. It's under the high priest's house. This is the entrance that I'm looking up at from the pit that Jesus' beaten body would have been dropped down through into this room where I was standing. I had the privilege of reading <clears throat> for the team while we squeezed into this pit. Next picture. This is the pit where Jesus probably lied waiting for those hours to go by. Next picture, the temple steps. This is pretty cool. These are the same. St okay. 
Yeah. Go to the next one too. Yeah. These are the same steps from Jesus' time. Okay. Very likely the same place where he did much of his teaching with his disciples. We sat there and Andre um, taught us. Um, and we had devotions there here on these same steps. To stand and to sit where Jesus stood and sat. That was wonderful. Okay. I can't read the Bible now the way I did before. Before I was reading it in black and white, and now I read it in color. I think, oh, I know where that place is. Oh, I can picture what that looks like. It's, it's changed everything. Why don't we all go back next year? <clears throat> Here we are, having communion where, the tradi where tradition says was the upper room, known as the cynical. This church was again built on top of an ancient synagogue where the actual room was said to be. There's some people who don't think so. There's others who think it's in another spot. We'll find out ten years from now. Ten years from now, we may actually be able to enter the original. The upper room right now is the lower room. <laughs> but what they've planted over the top of it really is spectacular. It's a beautiful room that we stood in. And just outside of that room is where we had communion together. And it was wonderful. <clears throat> oh, let me see. The team was able to visit so many places. The Pool of Bethesda, Hezekiah's Tunnel, the Shepherd's Fields, the Via Della Rosa, the Herodian, the Citadel, Golgotha, the Place of the Skull, the Garden Tomb, so many others. I didn't, I didn't give you all those pictures to look at. I've gone in a different direction. Different direction. Probably one of my three favorite spots is Tabga. <clears throat> Just, just, a, just a few hundred meters from Capernaum, underneath that Mount Abel, or Arbel, just over, just over to the right down there on the highway that runs in front of that mountain, was Tabga. <clears throat> Jesus' headquarters for most of his public ministry was in, in Capernaum, just right next door. But here I am standing on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. Those are my feet. Those are my shoes. As the Sea of Galilee laps on the rock formation to my left. Keep that in mind. So much happened right here. This is where Jesus called his first disciples. Three of Jesus' disciples were from this area. Bethsaida where, where, is where two of them were from. James and John were called right here at this beach where I'm standing. <clears throat> while they were working on their fishing boat. Matthew 4, 18-22. Jesus lived with two other fishermen. Peter and Andrew, just down the road from this place. That house, by the way, has been unearthed and is under a beautiful modern church for all to see. There's even a glass floor where you can look down at the old house. The old house, the walls are only about this tall, all stone, but probably the first church for the Christians in the world were there in Peter's house. <clears throat> Tabga is also where Jesus waited for the disciples to come back from a night of fishing. Remember that? <clears throat> and what, what did they find when they came back from fishing? What was Jesus doing? Yeah, he, that was another time. All right. When he came back from fishing. This is after the resurrection. He was, make, yeah, he was making breakfast. All right. Next picture. This rock here, by my feet, extends all the way into this church that was built over it. It's called Mensa Christi, the table of Christ. This is where, this is where that breakfast probably took place, right here. This is what tradition says. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> About eight years ago, I put up a beautiful um, picture on my computer. You call it wallpaper, right? You know what they call it? Oh, you're smart. How, how do I get how do I get that picture to show without these all these other things in the way? Just that picture in the back. I can tell the story without showing them. Probably, I'm gonna. You, you see the see the tree at the top? <laughs> okay, see the tree? Oh, it's gone. Yeah. 
In that room, all right, over there, I put some wallpaper on my computer about eight years ago. It was this, this beautiful picture of a temple. And I heard it was over in Israel someplace. Never thinking I'd ever go to Israel. I just thought it was a good picture. Um, I wouldn't even say it was on my bucket list. It wasn't. But just 60 days ago, I had somebody take this picture with me. Same picture, same spot. <laughs> okay. Isn't that cool? This is um, the Church of the Beatitudes. <clears throat> Just over the hill. It's, there's a, the, this is um, Mount Arbol is up to your right. You can almost look at it. This isn't, this isn't Capernaum. And you can look right down from this church. There's this amphitheater. Um, banana fields are there right now. But it would be an easy place for thousands of people to meet and listen to what Jesus was teaching about the Beatitudes. That's why it's called that. And, and um, Andre said to us, i got to be careful. See, I told you it was going to be 40 minutes. <clears throat> Andre said to us that you can speak down at the bottom, down by the road, and it's a natural amphitheater. There's, no other, there's very few other places like it on earth where everybody would hear all the way up the hill, Jesus just talking. It was the perfect place. God had the perfect place for Jesus to speak. <clears throat> I thought that was pretty cool. All right, we're at, we're at slide 34. Can you bear with me? Huh? You already, you already saw some of this. I want to close with this picture. It was a profoundly, it touched me. First of all, I, sh I should have never been able to take this photograph. Actually, no one should be able to take this picture. This altar is one of the high places that God says he hates in Scripture. King Ahaz, about 759 years before Jesus' birth, built this thing. 2 Chronicles 28, 25 says, In every town in Judah he built high places to burn sacrifices to other gods and arouse the anger of the Lord and God, and God of his ancestors. In 1 Kings 14 it says, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy more than all that their fathers had done with the sins which they committed. <clears throat> for they also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars. Excuse me, an ashram on every high hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. An altar stands in one of the oldest temples <clears throat> ever discovered, ever unearthed in Judah. This is one of those high places the Bible talks about. It's located in Arad, Tel Arad, in the southern part of Israel. It was unearthed in 1962. Before that time, it had just been covered over with dirt and rubble. It lies less than eight miles from Jerusalem. <clears throat> this is an Asherah pole on your right. It was erected in the Holy of Holies in this miniature temple, patterned after Solomon's temple. Obviously a no-no. You didn't do that. There's only one temple. It was in Jerusalem. Moses tells God's people in Deuteronomy 12, 2-3, destroy completely all the places on the high mountains, on the hills, and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. What you see in this photo is the Asherah pole on the right. A no-no. <clears throat> it represents Yahweh's wife, Jehovah's wife. It was set up right beside another stone representing Yahweh. Also a no-no. Show the next picture. Okay. This is... This is a mock-up of it in the uh, muse Israeli museum. You see Jehovah's stone on the left, which shouldn't have been there, and then Asherah's stone on the right, which certainly shouldn't have been there, and these two altars in the front, incense altars, one on the left and one on the right. <clears throat> now listen to this, 2 Kings 18, 1-4. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. 
His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed and the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. <clears throat> this thing was put out of commission during Hezekiah's reign, 586 B.C.? Is that what it is? His recruits must have thought that burning down the synagogue and covering it with rubble was enough. No, no one ever thought it would be uncovered. Never again. Well, it has been, and it has received a lot of attention. Notice the larger incense altar on the left for Yahweh and the additional altar on the right, smaller one for worshiping Asherah. <coughs> My, I'm losing my throat, but I've only got like a couple of, couple of paragraphs to go. A copy of this altar has been set up in the Israeli Museum in Israel. <clears throat> Aaron Ari, curator for archaeology of the Israel Museum's Iron Age and Persian period, where the artifacts are currently being held, recently initiated a project to utilize modern techniques to analyze the remains together with a chemist named Namdor who is also an archaeologist at the Volcani Archaeological Research Center. After analyzing the larger of the two altars, which stood 52 centimeters high, the team found remains of frankincense and aromatic resin used in incense and perfumes described in ancient Hebrew texts as one of the substances burned <coughs> and the grain offerings. This is the first report of frankincense being discovered at any archaeological site in the Levant. The true surprise, however, came when the smaller altar was analyzed. This altar, standing 40 centimeters high, was found to be covered with tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, cannabidiol, CBD, and cannabinol, all of which are found in cannabis. Ever heard about that? I counted four signs coming up the highway in the last two days advertising um, marijuana. One town says, this town's better because we have it here. I just found that interesting. The research team found that the frankincense had been burned together with animal fat, while the cannabis had burned, <coughs> been burned with animal dung. The fat would have helped raise the temperature of the frankincense to 260 degrees Celsius the temperature necessary to release the resin's pleasant aroma. The animal dung, however, would have been used to burn the cannabis at 150 degrees Celsius. Isn't it amazing what people study? The maximum temperature at which the psychoactive compounds of the cannabis would take effect. <clears throat> Isn't it amazing what you can find when you start digging? Isn't it amazing what God's people come up with to entertain themselves, even in the name of worship, that distresses the Lord? Disobedience reigns among God's people. It's why Jesus was sent to us. No wonder He sent Jesus to save us. I wonder what might be hiding in your life that you might just have covered over. Something perhaps you have forgotten about and, and hoping others have forgotten about too. Something that really needs to be unearthed and dealt with. God knows where it is. He sent Jesus to help us with whatever it is. However grievous it might be, He's in the business of raising up us up out of the darkness and bringing us into the light. Amen? Let me encourage you to grab a hold of him and let him pull you out of your hole. Whatever that might be. It might be fear. Whatever it might be. Remember that he has the power to unearth. For goodness sakes, he unearthed himself after three days of being dead, okay, crucified, buried, and raised again. He has the power of bringing you out of your darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? Amen. Thank, you. Thank you. Pastor.